tender technologies and paradoxical bodies, human, animal, and machine bodies. And as an artist, I've always been interested in stories, the stories we tell about ourselves and also the stories we tell about the technologies we use. I'm also really in interested in bodies, human, human bodies, machine bodies, and animal bodies. I've collaborated a lot with, uh, and I think a lot of my work is a form of dialogue either with other people, <coughs> buildings, ideas, seismic information, most recently my hermit crab. And I've also, this is a, an image um, from Robert Hooke's Micrographia, or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies by magnifying glasses with observations and inquiries thereupon. And Robert Hooke is one of my, my most famous scientists. He was, he's sadly neglected, which, you know, a little bit of identity there. And then, but he was also a polymath. He was a natural scientist, he was an architect, he was a mathematician. And one of the things of his many, many great accomplishments was he developed a lens for the compound microscope. And when he was doing this in the 17th century, the compound microscope was one of the latest technological innovations of its time. And what he did with it, one of the first things he looked at it was a flea. And to me, and he also waxes rhapsodic about this flea. And, um, and so that idea of working with technology, the latest technology, but actually with things that are the most banal, mundane, although in a way fleas are very powerful because they've been responsible for more deaths through bubonic plague than both world wars. Um, so this, a number of years ago, I took a research trip to a number of textile research labs in Canada and the Eastern United States. And this is a spider, it's the Nephila clavapes. It's one of the spiders um, that is an orb um, weaving spider, and it was at a time when there was a lot of interest in spider silk, trying to create a, a, a fiber that would be as strong as steel, but so much lighter. So I went into, it became a bit of a, almost like a fairy tale. This was in an old cabana sucre, which is a sugar shack in southern Quebec, where they were breeding goats that had been um, bred with the Nephiloclavicus spider, and they were milking the goat and spinning um, spinning the milk into a fiber that they hoped would um, become spiders, like a strong uh, a substitute for steel. Now research hasn't gone very far in that way. One of the other places I went to, which was in um, eastern US, uh, is Prodesco, which no longer exists. And they were doing medical textiles. And one of the most interesting things, it was like this ancient space, like there were looms, there were braiding machines, things that you might think of grandmothers doing, but all in these um, safe, safe, almost like um, a surgery. So one of the things that was so fascinating was again to think about this sort of relationship between old and new technologies. And one of the things that really struck me there was the mechanical, the biomechanical heart valve, which is what you see here. And the third one from the left. Um, I, it looks to me a little bit like an Eva Hess sculpture. But what was interesting there is that humans, as you well know, we're very compatible with cows and pigs, which is maybe not quite such a, a nice thought as um, in terms of how we think of ourselves. And so this, um, this, this bovine or porcine heart valve is then attached to a knit structure that is then inserted. And so it just got me thinking a little bit about well, you know, a lot of doctors, a lot of researchers, a lot of medicines are now also farmers. So where do these animals come from? And I've often had the feeling that technology is naked, that it has drifted from its animal roots, and that it's lost its origin story. And so in the work Pelt Bestiary, I wanted to give technology back its pelt and to return it to the bestial and to the messiness and to bring kind of the messiness of the world back into the digital realm. I've always been really interested in kind of grounding the digital experience in the material realm. And so this idea of, of fur or hair is historically in the West, it's always been sign of the other. If you look at um, uh, textiles, tapestries from the medieval times, there's a char character of the wildman and the wild man is always covered in fur and hair. And so it's always that association with the bestial. And so I wanted to make a set of automatons or robots that were intensely physical, intensely tactile. I've always been interested in 
kind of what I would call tender technology, and also dysfunctional technology, technology that is not always used for um, maybe practical functions. When we think of um, contemporary science fiction, or even the cyborg or the android, they always tend to depict um, the machine and the human as hard, dry, hairless bodies, and almost always human bodies. And if they are human bodies, they're almost always young, caucasian -y, maybe Asian and beautiful. And so I wanted to really, so I felt in some ways that another boundary to be breached was the boundary between the organism and the machine, between the machine and the human. And of course, that's also happening on, on many levels with xenotransplantation and microchimerism. So these beasts, um, it's, a nub, it's a rubber neoprene that is then tufted to make this in this surface. So it's very tactile. But if any of you have ever touched and then licked your fingers, you know, if you're touching neoprene, it has a, a pretty disgusting taste. So I wanted to make something that was both um, really seductive, but also kind of repellent. And in this case, there are about six, I call them beasts, and I have names for them. And after years of working with interactive media, I've noticed that people have become very, had a lot of expectations if it was interactive. They'd come and jump in front of it, they'd dance, and you know, if they didn't do anything, they'd be really upset. And so I wanted to see how far I could pull back to see what, how little I could do that people would still have a response. Um, and each of them had a very different set of motion. And so this one in the middle has a, a shutter. It's not interactive. And it has a very kind of a violent kind of um, movement. This one is on the edge of its podium, has probably some of the most complex motion, undulating motion. And one of the things, of course, for me is very important is how people interact with them. And I was sort of surprised because, again, like with many robots or automatons, if you take off this pelt, you see a bunch of machinery and parts. And yet the kind of, the way people interacted with these people, the care they took with them, it was interesting that children in a number of exhibitions were the first to see the movements and would often reenact them. Um, other people would pet them and take care of them. That's another one. One of the things too, in this one in fact, didn't move at all, but people, saw that it did move and they would describe the movement to me. And in a way, of course, it did move because every room has ventilation, has the movement of people's going, people going by. So there was a movement. And so this was idea of, in some ways, of the imaginary, both of what we want and the kind of, um, So in this one, the movement's very, very subtle, and it's a little bit like breathing. And when I was first working on the project, I had worked with actually different magnetic textiles, trying to make them be more of a, so this kind of repellent interaction would actually be repellent. But I found that actually this, which in a way is kind of a fiction, you know, it's motors, it's uh, a lot of Arduinos, solenoids, many different things actually created the impact, like that feeling of a kind of life form for many people. One of the other things that I did with this work was I, after the beasts were made, I, um, I drew very large portraits of them, about four or five by five feet. So we look at the beasts, they look at themselves. And again, trying to think a little bit of how to maybe rethink the human as always the model for the kind of machines we make. And so the, most of these were all based on, I did a lot of study at aquariums for movements. Also the other one was a cat, sort of like, sort of disdain. And some were with sensors, some were with not. And so this idea of trying to create in, intense sort of characters with this. One of the things I think is really important to show, it was interesting that for a number of years in Canada where I'm from, I was kicked out of the media arts community from our federal granting agency because my 
my work had become too material, and if I was going to be making automatons, they should be stainless steel or hard plastic. And of course, that was largely my point in making them. But I also want to acknowledge, in some ways, the, a lot of hand labor that went into it, even though this is not what it was about. I simply couldn't find the material, but a lot of the technologies that I use, you know, a lot of the actual physical materials are made in, you know, in factories in, um, in Asia, that it's sort of invisible labor that we never see. But with this one, because I couldn't find the surface I wanted, we actually had to make it and get all this neoprene, make our own tools. And so it was surprising, a project that I had hoped would be fairly sophisticated technology, technologically ended up having all this incredible handwork involved in it. Also, many, many tests, motion tests, different types of materials. Um, I, tech, I usually would prefer to find materials, but if I can't, I will um, make them myself. And then we ended up doing kind of an I Ikea test too. So we would, once we had a, um, had a material I really liked, kind of put it into a test for like a cup for about two months so we could actually see if it would stand up. So there's a lot of um, research in this work and it's a really fun part of it. And I really wished I'd had Jonas's workshop um, six years ago because for another project, it would have saved me so much time. Um, I'm now working on the second generation of the beasts and they're following their evolutionary story. So some of them will have more autonomous motion, different kinds of motion. They will be less pure in their materiality. Some will need some prosthetics. Um, and that's currently underway. I, I'm not going to show my latest piece because it's, um, it's not a soft robot. It's an angry machine. It's very hard, and it's so angry it has to be fenced in. Um, but in general, it, it has its own tactile materiality. Um, I'd like to thank, I work with a lot of people, they, so I wanted to acknowledge them. None of this work happens on its own. And it's not only the, the um, technical work they do, but also the conversations we have. And I think that's been one of the interesting things about working um, with technology is that it has become kind of a social practice in its, not in terms of the larger social field, but in terms of working with others. Um, and also is some of the agencies that had supported the work. So thank you.